Hi, and welcome to episode number 126 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Mandel, and I'm here with my colleague, as always, Melanie Warwick. How are you doing today, Melanie? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Very good. chipper today. I'm very feeling You very, are very chipper. I am very chipper today. Well, so this week, Mark, we're going to be talking with Holden, who's one of our colleagues, about Beam and Spark. Yeah, two great open source projects for processing big data at scale. Definitely. Before that, as always, we talk about our cool things of the week, and we do our question of the week at the end. And this week's question of the week is, I have a continuous integration build process set up with Container Builder, but it's all sequential. I want to speed things up by processing parts of it in parallel. How do I do that? But first, as always, cool things of the week. So Twitter is moving parts of its process to GCP, and we have a link to the blog post that talks about that, as well as some other additional kind of funny little bits. Apparently, it's moving its cold data storage and flexible compute Hadoops clusters to Google Cloud Platform, which is over 300 petabytes of data. And fun fact, Greg Wilson, our fearless leader, had pointed out that back in the day, for any of you out there who watched Star Trek Next Generation... I did may have noticed that Data, the actual robot, admitted to his brain having about 100 petabytes of data. So Twitter has more data than Data. Basically. Cool. That's cool. Maybe we will finally see Data come to life. Another cool thing of the week, Kaggle is running a contest in collaboration with CERN. CERN being a research organization that operates the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. And so this competition in particular is taking a lot of their data that they've collected and, and getting outside support in terms of seeing can machine learning assist in high energy physics and discovering and characterizing new particles. What's cool about the competition, outside of the fact that there's $25,000 prize money nice. that's associated to it, always good, is that it's coming in two parts. And so the first part of the competition is going to be made in July and they'll be focusing on more of the high score and it's more about the accuracy and this aligns with a conference IEEE WCCI competition that that's being presented in July. And then there's a throughput phase that's really more focused on the speed in terms of processing. And so this is aligned to a phase that's between July to October and will wrap up at Neural Information Processing Systems Conference in December. Nice. Yeah. So we've got a bunch of announcements around, strangely enough, containers and Kubernetes. I think one of the ones I'm really excited about is a project called uh, GVisor, uh, which we open sourced back in May 2nd. This is really interesting. This is a new kind of sandbox that provides secure isolation for containers while still being more lightweight than a virtual machine. So it integrates with Docker and Kubernetes, but really I think what's kind of exciting about this is it really imposes a very strong secure isolation layer for when you want to run code that you don't necessarily trust. Maybe it comes from outside or you're, you're opening things up or maybe you just want the extra layer of security. I think it's really, really cool in that really allows you to be able to run things in a very secure environment. Now, there is a trade-off. At its core, there is a user space kernel that basically emulates the Linux kernel, which does mean that the, the flexibility that you get comes at the price of higher per system call overhead. And there's some details in the blog post. But this is really exciting. Look for integrations with Docker. There's a, a sample in the blog post about how you can run it with Docker right now. Some experimental support potentially within Kubernetes as well. It's going to come down the line. So there's some really interesting opportunities here for being able to build some really interesting platforms for customers on top of this technology. I'm really excited about it. And then one of our colleagues, Ian Lewis, has a demo that there's a video actually at the end of the blog post we'll include in the show notes and you should check it out. Absolutely. Speaking of Kubernetes, of course, we announced the Stackdriver Kubernetes monitoring system. Basically, this is really cool. I really like this too. Uh, it's essentially a single pane of monitoring glass for your Kubernetes cluster, whether or not they run on like us on GKE or whether they run on-prem or other places. This is great too. It also hooks into Prometheus, which is pretty much the standard or the default uh, open source monitoring system as well. So you've got a lot of options there. I really like this. Right now, it's running on what looks like will be available in production clusters as soon as Kubernetes hits 1.10 on Kubernetes engine, but you can try it right now if you want to run an alpha cluster on us uh, and take it for a spin. That should be available to you so you can see what it's like, and we definitely want to hear your feedback. So in the blog post that we'll link to, there is a Google group where you can send all sorts of questions and feedback to as well. Great. 
One last thing we're going to mention for this week is that Google Research is actually participating in mlperf.org, which is this effort to basically set benchmarks to measure systems performance for both training and inference in machine learning performance. So this is a collaborative effort that's going on across a number of different corporations as well as education institutions and research organizations like University of California, Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, Google, Intel, Baidu, AMD. So basically... They're working together to try to come up with common standard benchmarks, which I think is really wonderful. And we will include the link in the show notes and you can check it out. All right, Mark, we had a lot of cool things of the week, especially because CubaCon was last week. Yes, it was. Now I think it's time for us to go talk with Holden. Let's do it. Today, I am particularly excited to have the always effervescent Holden Corral with us today. Holden, how are you doing today? I'm good. I've got coffee, which I've been told not to drink, (laughs) and uh, so I'm really looking forward to when this is over and I can drink my coffee. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today to chat all about Beam and Spark. Uh, Before we do that, though, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do here at Google and all that sort of stuff? Sure. So I focus mostly on open source big data tools, so things like Beam, Spark, to a lesser degree, other things like Kafka, which are not data processing per se, although moving more in that direction. And that's that's sort of my main focus is the open source tools that we have. And I mostly do sort of external facing work, uh, not a lot of internal stuff. But I, I do occasionally have delightful conversations with people about ways we can make our products, which are built on top of these open source things, more awesome. It's It's fun. People pay me to write open source code and fly around the world. So my life is pretty cool. And how did you get involved with Spark and Beam to begin with? So I got involved with Spark from the last time I was working at Google. Um, There was this thing called Flume Java, which was kind of cool, but I couldn't use it for any of my personal projects. And somehow back then I still had time in my life for personal (laughs) projects. And I was like, I really want to use this software, but, you know, I can't. So I looked around for an open source uh, re-implementation of Google technology, which is a pretty common approach in the in the big data world, and I found Spark, and I was like, oh, cool. This uses functional programming. This is awesome. Uh, that's, that's sort of how I got started with uh, Spark, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Was that in Scala when you were working with it? I mean, Spark started in Scala, and it's still in Scala now, but you can use it in other languages as well. Um, but for me, that Scala was actually a pretty good fit. Um, I'd just come from Foursquare, where everything was built in Scala, And um, I really like functional programming. I think it's a kind of nice way of thinking about the world. And so I I really enjoyed a framework that really put a functional approach to dealing with data. I I felt it was a really cool fit. Cool. Um, Let's take a small step back. For those people who aren't as familiar with, say, Spark or Beam, what's the kind of problem that those those products are trying to solve? Both Spark and Beam and, and a lot of other things in this space essentially solve the problem of you have a lot of data and you want to do something with it, and it's, it's too much data to fit on a single computer or um, maybe even a few single computers. And it's about splitting the problems up, distributing both the data and the computation, and then collecting the results back in a way that you can use them. So some of the classic problems where people use this are things like training recommendation systems, where you have a lot of information from all of your different users. Other times it's things like fraud detection, where we'll have like a lot of transactions and and we'll want to train models. It's not just machine learning. Uh, it's also often used for ETL. So like we might have an old legacy database, which we also want to expose in a nicer way. And so you might have a batch job which comes in and you know picks up your data from your legacy database and makes it available to people to do sort of exploratory analytics on. And where did Beam come from? Beam came from sort of a large number of different Google projects. It's sort of the grandchild, in a way, of of Millwheel and and other things like this. So it's the grandchild of a lot of Google big data tools. It brings a lot of the learnings that we've had from working on MapReduce and working on things like Millwheel and and other analytics tools and, and brings them all together into one place. The idea is that Beam will provide a portability layer from Google Dataflow, which exposes all of these cool tools to people to use, to things besides Google Dataflow. Because as much as we love people that use Google tools, not everyone wants to write their code against just a Google backend. They want to be able to run it in multiple places. Um, Some people have like analytics jobs 
which they need to do both on like data, which is less secretive. And then they have like similar jobs, which have to be run on like super secret data, which they can't put in the cloud yet for maybe regulatory reasons. And so having a system which is able to both run in the cloud and run on-prem is a really cool idea. And it's one where we've perhaps not quite delivered what we set out to do initially, but I'm, I'm really excited about the direction we're taking with it this year. I just yesterday was at Flink Forward uh, where we were talking about some of the work which we've been doing around making Beam on top of Flink, which is an open source Apache project, um, a better experience for people. So this sounds great, but you work on Spark and on Beam. Yeah. Are they competing open source products or what's the relationship there? So it's it's complicated, right? Um, <laughs> I, I want to be clear, like, there's also Apache Flink and other open source mm -hmm. runners which do similar data processing tools. And we all take slightly different approaches to solving the same problem. And at the end of the day, what happens is we tend to go and steal the best ideas from, from each other because it's open source and we can do that. Mm -hmm. Everyone wins this way, right? And we also, by competing with each other to some degree, push the state of the market forward. And so in some places, like Beam and Spark are competitors. In other places, you could actually use Beam on top of Spark. And so they can be complementary. And it, it's really confusing if you're not from an open source background to think of this like mixture of, of competing and cooperating at the same time. But I think it's a really good model. Are there particular cases where you would use, say, one or the other or together or... The cases where you would use Beam is probably more around streaming. Historically, Spark streaming has had maybe not as great support as in Beam, although Spark streaming is, of course, also improving. Like one of the things which continues to happen in these places is like, you know, we'll do something cool. Someone else will do something cool. Sometimes it'll actually be the same developer in two different projects. <laughs> um, like there's there's pieces of code that I've written which are not the same code, but accomplish the same task in both Spark and Beam. Anyways, back to being more likely to use it if you're interested in portability between Google Cloud and an on-prem solution or, or other things like that. Spark, though, for example, has a really much more options in terms of machine learning. Beam takes a, from a programmatic standpoint, so the Beam SDK is, is very much focused around sort of whole program optimization. And it's really cool, and you can do a bunch of interesting things as a result. But because of the way how it was initially built, it's kind of difficult to do iterative algorithms like gradient descent, which are really common in machine learning. And so Spark has like a more full-featured uh, set of machine learning tools that are available for it um, right now. Now. Although, of course, you know, Beam is looking at what it can do to improve its machine learning options, and none of these things really remain static. So you've talked about how they're both open source. We also have them at GCP. And so how does that work? Are they managed versions of these products? Indeed. And if so, what are they? Glorious Employer provides excellent <laughs> managed <laughs> solutions. I wasn't teeing that one up at all for that one. Yeah, all for that. There's Dataflow where you can run Beam. Um, Beam on top of Dataflow is a really good experience. Spark actually has two different managed backends which you could use at Google um, and different levels of support associated with those different backends both in terms of just functionality and actual support. So Dataproc is probably what most people think of as the managed solution for Spark at Google. I'm really excited about where we're going with that. Um, there's, there's a lot of exciting improvements we can make there. The other one, which is new, because in Spark 2.3, we added support for Kubernetes. And this is really exciting because it now means that Spark can run on top of things like GKE. And actually, like one of the things, it's a little clunky to use right now, but with Spark on top of Kubernetes, you really need a separate distributed file system available because it, it doesn't tend to ship with one, whereas Spark on Dataproc traditionally ships with an HDFS yarn provider. And so running Spark on Kubernetes in the cloud is a much better experience because you tend to have an object store like GCS available to use. And so it's pretty cool. Spark on GKE is like a managed service, but if you run into difficulties, I mean, it's it's like a managed service on the Kubernetes side, and if you run into Spark-specific difficulties, you're probably not going to get a, as much support as you would if you were in Dataproc, but it's a really fun way to try out like um, cutting-edge stuff, and I actually have a blog post on the GCP Big Data blog about how you can try out different new versions of Spark. And actually, like, not that I'm just trying to get people to do my work for me. But you are. It's called delegation, I believe. Well, no, no, no. This is um, <laughs> it's, it's delegation Efficiency. when we're at the same company. And it's um, valued partnership building. There, there, you, go. there you go. Yeah, it's going in my personal accomplishments if anyone actually picks up these tasks. Please do. 
So one of the things which I would really like the community's help with, and especially like if you are a Spark user, if you're not, like don't don't feel obligated to do this at all, but come release time, we we have this process where we make candidates for release, right? And it's like, we think this is a pretty good release, but we're limited by the workloads that we know about, right? And this is this is open source we, not the Google we. And so the people involved with the Spark project, like the core developers, it's a large set of people, but it's not, you know, c- completely representative of actual users. And um, if you wanted to and you were using GCP, you could try out your workloads on top of Spark with GKE with one of these release candidates with the instructions in that blog post. And if it doesn't work, you can let us know so we don't release broken software and have to patch it later. Right? You can, you can help us catch our bugs earlier and we can we can make better software together so if you already have maybe a production workload set up on say gke or something like that you could spin it up and just take it for a test run and see what happens totally but definitely like take it for a test run in an account with like lower permissions so that you yeah. don't overwrite your data just in case we like uh screwed up really badly or make a copy or something yeah yeah sure copies are cheap <laughs> right <laughs> i don't actually know how much we charge for anything cloud privilege i understand that What's changed to make both Beam and Spark put so much focus on non-JVM languages? So I think the biggest change is that deep learning is very cool right now. And people are trying to raise money in Silicon Valley. I mean, we're not. We're a publicly traded company. But a lot of the like open source companies are like, ooh, I need to add some AI to my... Uh... Spread some AI on that. It looks yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks a lot better. We're not, just a, we're not just a big data company. We're a big data machine learning company. But, you know, big data machine learning isn't as cool as big data deep learning. There are some JVM tools for deep learning, but there's not quite the same full range of options as there are in Python or other languages. And a lot of people really want to be able to just copy and paste that Python code and have it run rather than translate it into Java, because it's like a lot less work for raising your next round of funding. And so really it comes down to people in Java now are actually wanting to use Python code. Um, And this is really exciting as someone whose job it is to make Python and Java work together. Like, that's my role to a large degree. Those communities don't always get along, too. Uh, No, historically, they have very nice things to say about each other. Yes, they do. They they very much respect wholeheartedly each other's different point of views on coding. But anyways, yes, you were saying. Yeah, super awkward when you're in between those two communities and you're just like, "Mm, maybe let's stop making fun of classes. I know. (laughs) Or like, I know the Jill's a thing, but it's not that bad. Anyways, whatever. And I actually like both languages for different reasons and don't like both languages for different reasons. But yes, I can see where the, the disconnect comes from. But getting back to the the main point of your question, people are now trying to use Python code from Java, and it's really exciting because the Python people have always been trying to use some of the big data Java code. And now that both sides are working together rather than just like random people like me hanging out in the middle, you know, there's there's a lot more interest. And so you see projects like Apache Arrow, which are really exciting and provide like a common data format between the different languages so they can interoperate a lot better. And so this is, I think, really exciting. Is it just Python or like... No, Arrow is is not just Python. It's Python, R, Java, I think JavaScript, but like don't hold me to that one, and Go. People were talking about on the mailing list, and I'm sure there's more that I'm just not keeping up with. I mostly care about the Python community, but other things are good too. And does that mean then you can use those languages on Spark or Beam as well, or is that just Python and Java derivatives? Yeah, so... It doesn't mean that we can necessarily use those languages together. In in Spark, we can use both Python and R. Um, In Beam, there's actually interesting work being done to add support for Go, which is actually something that I demoed yesterday at Flink Forward. Uh, Word count is the best demo ever at a big data conference. (laughs) Uh, We counted a lot of words, genuine big data. Yep. So Beam doesn't actually depend on Arrow because Beam has this sort of Google lineage. It, it actually uses flat buffers and, and other things like this, which are very similar to Arrow, but you know, how slightly different in pretty uninteresting ways. Uh, unless you really like C plus plus code, which is fine too. It's it's more or less unrelated, but they're following similar approaches. Um, and just because we have a common format to get the data between each other, there's this other sort of challenge where we have to figure out a way to take our functions and serialize them and send them across the wire and, and deal with that in a nice way for execution on another machine. And so in Python, that's like a moderate amount of work, and we use like a weird custom serializer to make it happen. 
in Go. It's also a non-trivial amount of work, um, and so it, it like there's there's other problems that have to be solved to make a language work here. But having a common data format is one of the prerequisites. So it's exciting to see that part get unlocked for more languages. Nice. Someone who hasn't touched Sparkle Beam. What does the development cycle look like? How does that that whole process go? Like, if I'm like, I have some data and I want to process it to either learn something about it or or change it, what does that look like? So they actually have slightly different processes as common sort of first paths. Um, in Spark, it's really common to get started by. Um, opening up a notebook and sort of just like poking at your data for a while to be like, I wonder, maybe it does. No, that doesn't work. Okay, and what about this? Um, and it's it's a very iterative nature. Um, that tends to be more for Python and Scala developers. Java developers, you know, you you spin up a new project, you make a jar, you submit it to the cluster, you take a look at it, and it's a little more heavyweight when you're working in Java, and it's also a little more heavyweight when like my cost to test something out is like compiling my project and submitting the jar, even though like it may take similar amounts of time, the the mental overhead is more than Shift Enter, and so for Java developers, it tends to be more like you'll print out your schemas. You'll look at it. You'll make like a quick test pipeline, and then you'll like sample the data and run it through to see what happens. Um, and with Python and Scala developers in the Sparkland, you you tend to use a notebook and sort of poke at it that way. So more like an online REPL type thing. Yeah. Nice. Um, and in the Beamland, the online REPL thing, not not so happy just yet. Okay. Um, it's more focused around sort of traditional jobs where you submit you know a package to the cluster. So basically, I write some code in some language. I submit it to the cluster, and it's the cluster's job that splits that up and parallelizes that work. Yeah, totally. If you really want, you can do things slightly differently. One of the things which I do because I travel so much is I'll also, if I'm working with non-sensitive data, I'll sample my data and save it locally to my machine. And then uh, both Beam and Spark have this concept of like a local mode runner, where you can just like run your stuff against like a local copy of your data to just like check and make sure that it works. So it, you know your your development cycle isn't super long. You're not always having to submit something to the cluster. You can just like try that stuff out locally before you run it on your genuine big data. Um, there's air quotes around that just to clarify. <laughs> nice. Uh, what type of machine learning options are there? In Spark, there's a lot of different machine learning options. From a just sort of design point of view, writing iterative algorithms in Spark is a lot easier than writing iterative algorithms in Beam. So things like gradient descent are just a little easier to write in Spark just because of the way how uh, these two platforms were developed. And so Spark has kind of a sort of a head start and a lead there. And so you can do like linear regression, you know, just classic good old fashioned stuff. You can make your decision trees, you can make your random forests, um, sort of all of the classical both regression and classification algorithms. And then there's also this collection of Spark packages, which essentially comes from, I mean, there's just not enough ML reviewers inside of Spark. And when people show up with new algorithms, I'm just like, I could read your paper or I could take a bath <laughs> and then <laughs> and read it while you're in the bath. No. Yeah, no. No. I, that's where email gets done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's important. Very important. But no, so it's it's just like the, the amount of work to like review an algorithm for inclusion is like really, really high um, because you want to make sure it's like correct. Um, and you also want to make sure that it's maintained. And nothing against grad students. I, I love grad students and their code. But um, pretty frequently, a lot of people will show up with an algorithm that they've implemented in Spark from like part of their grad project. And it's just like, we'd love to take this, but we also know you're going going to graduate really soon and who's going to maintain this when you go work in industry or you know go and become a full professor maybe you'll get your like new tiny grad students to to look after this but I'm not sure if you want to go and try that grad student code, you can totally go to like spark-packages.org and like scroll through the list of um, grad student machine learning models and pick your favorite one uh, and just hope they keep it up to date or your business process changes before you need any bug fixes. Or you can become a machine learning developer yourself, um, which is great. And uh, if you make your business process depend on it first, no, there's not a lot your boss can do. Uh, <laughs> Whether you're doing machine learning or not. What does it look like to contribute to Beam and Spark? Totally. So they're both open source projects, and they're both within the Apache Foundation. Um, and this is cool because it means that there's um, 
some common elements of culture between the two. Obviously, the people are different. Um, or sorry, not obviously, but the people are different between the two to some degree. And so there are different cultural practices that have developed, but there's sort of a common framework for how you go about this. Um, in both cases, uh, you start by subscribing to the developer mailing list. And it tends to be like uh, dev-subscribe at beam or spark.apache.org. Um, and then you can subscribe to the mailing list. And you can start to see what other developers are working on. And then you can also say like, hey, what's up? I'm new here. Like, does anyone want to like give me some guidance? Um, if you do that on the Spark project, there's a really good chance you'll get ignored. If you do that in the Beam project, it's more likely people will be like, yay, new friends. Hmm. Um, and this is mostly just because like Beam is, is a younger open source project than Spark. And so um, it's easier to be like, I don't have 200 other people I'm already working with. Here's a new person. Let's do this. And in Spark, it's like, I have 200 open pull requests that I need to review. If you come with some code, I'll help you, but not yet. And so that, that can be a little different. Um, in both cases, Jira is used to track the issues. So you can go into Jira. You can look at open issues. You can look at things which people have maybe tagged as starter issues. Um, they're broken down by components. So I, myself, personally, mostly go and look at either the Python or ML issues uh, in each project and see if there's anything that people are encountering as either bugs or improvements that I want to work on. And those are things that I pick up and do. Um, and then they're both on GitHub. They both accept pull requests. And uh, you, you can sort of go from there. Um, they each have their own contributing guide as well on their websites that you can look at. Um, and they have style guides as well, because when you, you have open source projects like this, you, you want a consistent style, even though you know we don't work at the same company and don't have the same shared style guide. So each project has its own style. Switching between the two projects is great, because the styles are different. And that's just super easy to keep straight in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I love my life. What are you excited about the work you're doing? Well, so there's different kinds of excitement, right? There's excitement about code, and there's excitement about, like, uh, code other people are writing. And then there's excitement about, like, people um, that I get to meet when I, I go out into the open source world. So the excitement about code that I'm writing is mostly there's some stuff around improving the speed at which Python and Java are able to work together. And that is something I'm personally really passionate about. Um, and I'm excited to make that more awesome. And I actually have a talk at Spark Summit SF about how you can use that to use TensorFlow inside of Spark. Um, and you can use similar techniques uh, inside of Beam, but it's more complicated. Um, and so that talk will probably be a quarter later once I work out some more bugs. Um, so like one thing, then the other thing. Um, code other people are writing that I'm excited about. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting, exciting things in both projects which are happening around sort of improving the SQL experience. And I think this is a thing which is often overlooked, at least among people like myself. Is this like a BigQuery-like experience type thing on top of Spark? Is that kind of how that works? It is. It's similar to BigQuery, uh, except it runs with the Spark engine, so it's less managed, um, and there's there's sort of more of a maintenance overhead. But the idea is that you can write SQL queries against your traditional big data. The nice thing about that is if you work with someone from maybe more of a data analyst background who might be more comfortable working with SQL, they might produce some really cool insights, and then it becomes your job to productionize them. And then that can sometimes mean rewriting SQL into Java, and that's about no units of fun. Um, but instead, because it has an integrated SQL engine, you can you know just plop that SQL statement in, and then rewrite the like critical path or the the expensive parts into your Java code while keeping most of this existing SQL code. Or if you know the SQL code runs fine, you can just plop it into your jar and consume it downstream in the rest of your ETL pipeline. Anyway, so there's there's improvements happening in both Beam and Spark all around SQL, and that's really exciting uh, to see that happening. Are there any other improvements or future features that you're looking forward to? Yeah. In both cases, they're open source projects. So there's like features which I think might happen, but it's really difficult to say for sure what will happen because it, it comes down to what the community ends up wanting. And like even if, for example, I were to show up with code, there's no guarantee that that's going to be what the community wants. Like I can commit my stuff in Spark. If we don't have a consensus, it's considered impolite to to make changes more than impolite. But you know, <laughs> it's it's important that we all work together. And so I can. There's things which are far enough along that I'm pretty sure they're going to happen, like the, the SQL improvements are going to happen. And everything else is a little more, eh, who knows if it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, 
You mentioned that you've got a lot of talks that you do. And were there any talks in particular that you wanted to, to talk about that you're going to be doing soon? Yeah. Um, so I have some ones that I'm, I'm excited about. I'll be at PyCon very soon as well. Um, I'll, I'll actually go from PyCon to Scala Days, which is very symbolic of my life in a lot of ways. <laughs> both of those talks are exciting, uh, and I, I love both the Python and Scala community, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that in, in May. And I'll also be at Strata London and then Jay on the Beach. Um, I've never been to Jay on the Beach before, but from what my coworkers have told me, it's a really amazing conference, so I'm looking forward to that as well. What does the J stand for? Java. Java, okay. Um, and Spark Summit SF, of course, in June. I'm really excited about that talk. I think it's going to be really cool, and I really hope my demo doesn't crash. Nice. I don't know. Jay on the beach makes me think like sandals standing out on the beach with a projector. I don't think it's actually like physically on the beach, although I did now go to a conference. <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, no, I mean, like, I could be wrong. I went to a conference in Amsterdam where I was like, there's no way this is actually on the water. And then I was like, oh, this is on a boat on the water. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Um, and so, like, if it is, like, I can get out my mermaid tail, probably. And that'll be an exciting opportunity to give a mermaid presentation, but... Nice. Sweet. All right, well, before we wrap up today, is there anything we haven't mentioned or something cool you want to talk about? Or So one of the other things which I'm, I'm passionate about as well is testing and validating these big data pipelines. I think it's really important. It's often overlooked because it's a little harder to do than in our other projects. And uh, a lot of humans, when encountered with a problem, slightly harder which literally does not catch on fire, just kind of walk around it. And while it doesn't catch on fire, it does catch on fire later. In a little survey that I ran with a few hundred respondents, 15% of people said that their big data pipelines cause serious production outages. Um, and that's like a lot. And I enjoy not having to keep a up-to-date resume. And I assume other people do too. I also don't want the software projects that I work on to be responsible for my death. So I think people should definitely test their Spark and Beam code. Um, in Spark, there's this project called Spark Testing Base, which I work on, um, which makes it easier to test your code. And in Beam, it's actually really nice. There's um, built-in primitives for doing high-quality testing. There's things called PSERTs, which make it really easy to do pipeline assertions in Beam. And I think they're really cool and perhaps underused. And so I would Always encourage people, please test and validate your pipelines. Uh, if you don't know how, I have talks on the subject. Awesome. We'll chuck some in the show notes. Well, Holden, thank you so much for joining us and hanging out with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Yes. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. And I can drink my coffee now, right? Yes, you can yes, drink you can. your coffee. And yes, it was a lot of fun. So we're glad you joined us. Yay. I didn't even swear that much. <laughs> <laughs> or at all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you again, Holden. That was wonderful to talk with you about Spark and Beam. And I really have fun, actually, yeah. hearing her perspective on the world around us, actually. Yeah. No, it's always great to chat with Holden. Big fan. Big fan. Yes. All right, Mark, question of the week. Question of the week. So I have a continuous integration build process set up with Container Builder, but it's all sequential. So to speed things up, how would I basically process parts of it in parallel? So I found this out the other day and I got really, really excited about it. I'll talk through basically how I've got things set up so that it probably gives some context. So I've got a continuous build process running, strangely enough, for Gonis. It has a bunch of build steps, right? Uh, run tests, and then I build some images, and then I put those images up on container registry, right? Like pretty standard continuous integration type things. But they're all sequential, right? So I have to wait for my tests to finish before my build image, like I start building my container images. Or I actually have to, so I have to run my tests and then build my binaries, then push my binaries into the container image and build the image, right? And it's all sequential. Now, in theory, I could run my tests at the same time I'm building my binaries, right? There's, there's really no reason why I have to wait for one or the other. If either of them fail, then like that's it, we're done. And I didn't think you could do this in Container Builder, but you can. So there's basically a configuration option called wait for. We'll put a link in the show notes to the exact documentation, but there's a configuration option for each step that you can put in wait for. You can put wait for dash, which just says start it right away. I don't care. I'm not going to wait for anything else. But you can also give IDs to steps, and then basically you just say, wait for this list of IDs. And then so you can do both uh, splitting, so you can s split out. So like, uh, you know, first one starts, and then three will go, and then you can do joining back again. So you wait for all of these steps to complete, and it comes back. And so you can do parallel processing and speed up your builds. That's great. Well, thanks for that tip of the week. So, Mark, are you going anywhere fun, fabulous, speaking someplace soon? 
Uh, I don't think I am at the moment. Still doing stuff for Next. Uh, still live streaming on Twitch. And this week, IO is happening as we speak. Yes, there's that too. That is going on. You're not going down to IO. I am not going to IO because I will be in San Diego actually the day this is launched, yep. which I will be at Internet 2 Global Summit speaking on a panel. And yes. probably either before or after this gets launched. So yeah, that's cool. this week. Excellent. Well, Mark, it's been fun. Yeah, thanks again for joining me on this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you. And thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. 